All right, welcome to the Mycroft uh, 26th of August developer sync meeting. Uh, so last time we went over our uh, sprint planning for this uh, next two weeks. And today we're just going to go through and uh, check in on progress and anything that uh, people might getting might be getting hung up on. So um, I think we'll just go through roundtable style here. And uh, Ken is in the middle, the top right there. So go ahead, Ken. All right. So it's been a interesting week. Uh, a couple of things. I read through your user stories wiki page and commented, made some comments on it. Um, I understand where you're coming from, I believe, which is you're trying to touch upon all of the things the data model should be able to speak to. Uh, I took it that way. At first, I was confused and I was taking it like we want all this functionality. And then I realized you're probably speaking to the data model more than anything on that page. Uh, so I made some comments. Um, I finished the auto train process. I am ready to integrate it with the new schema when it is ready. Uh, to that end, I threw up a couple of uh, wiki pages describing that process in depth and another one. Uh, so the one is called Continuous Model Training, um, and it tells you what servers are running, what code, and all of that good stuff, um, and why the limitations or the implementation are is implemented the way it is or tried to justify it. Uh, I created another wiki page. Um, which describes some of the factors that affect the model's performance, just a placeholder. I'd like to get deeper on that at some point. Um, I created a bunch of models. I've hit some interesting problems with hyperparameters and overtraining. Uh, so I'm, I'm researching that. In so doing, it came to my attention and I actually commented on one of the tickets that you and Chris had commented on, on one of the wiki pages, or I think it was a ticket or a wiki page. But the subject was around the concept of a model or the model of a model. <laughs> so the continuous model training page now has a section called model object, which describes this artist's interpretation of the representation of a model. Uh, to that end, the automated process, um, when it's done, it runs some tests. What I'm thinking of doing is creating a model database. Uh, and I'll put the schema up. And after every new model is created and the tests are run, making entries in the model database so that in the future, somebody that's doing hyperparameter tuning can mm -hmm. select them out in an organized manner and possibly start looking at clusters because I really do believe it's that kind of a problem, not a linear increase the RCUs and it gets better, add more epics and it gets better kind of thing. It's a relationship between the hyperparameters and the data set size and possibly data set quality. Um, and so the only way you're going to get to the, to the answers is to have the data. And so I'm just thinking it would be helpful that every time we train the new model, we simply made an entry in the table, um, you know, broke out, you know, the uh, hyperparameters as well so that you can select and get your data sets. And then somebody better than me can come along and stand on my shoulders and use that data to do something with it. So that end, I'm working on that a little bit. And then I had an idea I want to run by everybody. I created a ticket, but I didn't assign it or put it anywhere because I just wanted to see if you thought it was worth following up on. And it, and it goes, speaks to what you were actually saying to a certain extent, a little bit, Michael, um, on that one page. But basically, what if we had a skill that you could say, improve recognizer, and it would play back the last 10 or 20 samples that it had captured not only had it sent them up to the cloud, but it had saved them locally. And uh, it would say, you know, maybe four or five at a time, just very briefly, was this a wake word? Was this a wake word? Was this a wake word? And then upload the results to the tag database. So now the user could not only help improve the quality, but much more importantly, after enough of those runs, I could then fire off a task that since all of those now tag samples are in the database, select them out, just his, take the existing community model that he has running in his local server and do an incremental training session using his new sample tag data. Because when you do incremental training, which is actually the bane of machine language processing or machine learning, but it's great for this example, um, the newer samples get prioritized kind of higher by default. 
in these algorithms. They fight to make that not happen, with dropout and all sorts of things. So by incrementally training on your last 20 or 30 samples you tag, that model will specifically continue, even though it's a community model, it will start getting better for you personally or the people that are using that device. So I thought that might be a, a one way around that, that problem space as well. So I threw a ticket out there as well to see if we wanted to get any traction. And um, that's it. I'm getting ready to publish the, uh, the model schema and start populating that model database, which is why I asked you, Chris, because I'll make it a separate model database in the MariaDB, and then later you can just bring it on over and it'll be in your Cellini database as well. And then I'm not blocked, right? So anyway, that's, that's what I was working on. Oh, and I've been trying to help keep up with the forums. I suspect, <laughs> this, this is really weird. I, I suspect the latest release broke for size. <laughs> And I know everybody's like, ah, but you really can't test for that because we do continuous integration and deployment in the cloud, if I'm not mistaken. And all of the VoIP comp stuff I did would have to actually run on a head server, not a headless server, because you can't do real feed, loop feedback through a microphone speaker system when you don't when you have a headless server that doesn't support a microphone and a speaker. So there's no way to catch that. And I suspect what happened, and I'll tell you, it's a little complicated. I actually have an email to Ake on this. When Ake was breaking me in, we discussed the concept of the next release, and he had mentioned that he had to work around in the new runner for problems that existed. And what I'm suspecting is happening is the runner and the engine are 02. In other words, the runner is 03. It's, it's running the 02 engine. It's because that's 03, it thinks it's 03, and it's pulling the models down from an 03 model repository, and we know 03 models are not backward compatible with an 02 engine. So I have an email into Ake to say, hey, do you think this might be happening? And I'll follow up on it as well. But I've been trying to keep up with the people in the forums because there's been some uh, mattermost and forum chatter about it, and so I'm, I'm working on looking at that as well. And that's it for me. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's a good, really good flag. I mean, one thing to note is that we planned three phases in the Voigtkampf uh, continuous integration system, and we've only implemented phase one at this point. Um, you know, the, the next phases will integrate just what you're talking about, uh, incorporating the actual uh, text-to-speech, or speech-to-text and text-to-speech um, issues, and then ultimately a, uh, a hardware in, uh, infrastructure as well, so that we can test it on the actual running hardware. Um, but none of that's actually implemented right now, so that's a no yeah, well, problem. I was just trying to, I was just trying to give an excuse <coughs> for why this wasn't caught. Yeah, no, um, and that's that's a good point. Uh, there's, it should have been caught anyway because we're supposed to test these releases on actual hardware before we send them out. Um, I, I don't I don't know about that. Uh, that's that's something that we'll I'll learn more about in the future. I'm sure by osmosis. Okay, so but you're. The stat status right now is that you've logged the, you've created a log for a, a problem that people are reporting, right? A, a uh, well, for that. no, what I did is I saw that there, the chatter was heating up. Uh, at, for, you know, it was a re you always see people complaining about, you know, custom wakeboards not working, right? That's common. Um, and that's a really involved, you know, solution. So I try to not get into that hornet's nest. But what I have been seeing more recently was people saying it just, precise doesn't seem to be working. And I'm positive that my hardware is good, you know. And I then started seeing more of this and thought back to what Ake had told me and said, well, gee, I could see where if it thinks it's 03 and it's running an 03 engine, it will pull an 03 model. Or well, maybe it's running right. 02 because he had to do a workaround, I mean. But, but the wrapper says it's 03. So it's running an 02 engine, but it sees the wrapper is 03, so it's pulling it down an 03 model. And we know that's not going to work is my point. So are they reporting what hardware they're running on? Are they running on Mark 1s or on Pycrofts or what? Uh, they're running on custom, uh, you know, regular laptop running Ubuntu 20 is the last one I saw. Um, hmm. And it was something to do with the ARM architecture, uh, that the O3 image wasn't ready for ARM during the O2 release or something. I mean, I'm not positive okay. on all of that, and that's what I'm chasing down as I'm asking for more input. Give me the engine, give me the repository, uh, you know, hash that you believe it's pulling from, that kind of stuff, and I'll step through it and work with them. And like I said, I have an email into Ake saying, hey, 
I suspect this could this be so. So he'll probably see that tonight. Sometime. Okay. We'll make sure to write up a ticket for that and, and, and try to figure out what version of the software and hardware they're using and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, I, I guess okay. I was only apprehensive about writing up a ticket because I wasn't sure it was a real problem yet, but uh, I'll write it up because worst case, it's not, and we can close it out. Well, exactly, yeah. You're spending time on it. Uh, it's good to know. Yeah, maybe, yep. we'll, maybe we'll learn something here. Um, okay. It's unfortunate that Gez is out right now, but... Uh, <laughs> That's okay. Actually, yeah. I can hold up the fort a little bit before him. Okay. You mentioned a couple other things that uh, I wanted to touch on there, uh, but they've slipped my mind, so I'll just let it go for now. I'll go back and look at the notes. Uh, so how about Chris Bear? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I spent a good part of Monday and the start of my Tuesday reorganizing JIRA a bit. Um, that's just time consuming. So um, I think it's all, it's in a pretty good place right now. And uh, I moved on then um, to re-implementing the schema as we defined it in our meetings last week. So the DDL is written and I wrote a, uh, an SQL script that will take um, our current um, database. So I wrote, I wrote the code so you can rebootstrap it um, basically um, from scratch if you want to. And now I'm, and I also wrote an SQL script for the test and production databases that will update them um, with the new schema stuff. So right now I am working on um, the code that uses the schema. Uh, my first step is to update um, any code that was broken um, by the new schema. And then I'm gonna go in and um, add, add the stuff we need for the new collection mechanisms. Um, again, a lot of this code is written. I'm just, you know, looking at the code I've written right now and seeing how it, you know, how it needs to change for the schema as it changed last week. So that will, that's where, where I am and I will, Probably be spending the rest of my week doing. No blockers. Everything's cruising along. Okay. Good. Um, Derek. Hey guys. Um, yeah. So I don't uh, really have any big blockers. Um, just continuing to work. I was finishing up. Uh, kids device and gonna get that sent uh, tomorrow um, <clears throat> and I've also got the enclosure for uh, the last thing I needed to do before sending the enclosure to Kevin was test the audio chamber it was slightly different I did that yesterday and uh, uh, sounds pretty good I think I actually need to tweak the work uh, a little bit but it's plenty fine. Um, so we'll go with that for now. And I've updated uh, that design, that laser cut design that I'm sending to Kevin to be assembled with, uh, with screws instead of glue. Um, kind of, if you guys ever look at some DIY projects out there, laser cut, they've got this kind of T-slot screw assembly. Um, with the uh, with the idea there, I, that it can be easily shared with the community, like you can just put one to get a super easy. Actually, the um, uh, could be something that we consider, you know, making available to those backers or to anyone really um, that just got that just got the boards because it'd be a, a cheap and easy housing that someone could put together. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so then uh, <clears throat> uh, the, last, the other two big projects related to that are just getting a version of that same enclosure that is a modified top to use the re-speaker microarray so that we have like an apples to apples re-speaker versus the SJ201. Uh, and then I'll get back onto the actual plastics design. There is one thing that I ran into yesterday while trying to test Kim's device that was troubling me. I did finally get past it, um, and that was this this audio playback bug. I sent a clip to Josh and, um, 
uh, Michael, I can send it to you too, the rest of you guys. Uh, this is a known bug, we've known about it, but it just seems to be um, popping up so frequently now. I'm not sure why versus a couple of weeks ago, but I was, you know, the, the problem with it is it, is it like, for example, I booted the, uh, the devices that I was testing for Kim within fresh image, like four or five times I had to reboot it before the audio stuff actually worked. So as you can you know, guess, that comes kind of frustrating for, for me on the hardware side, because I'm like, at what point do I say, Hey, Mycroft. Okay, I know it's probably going to work, but is this what hardware, time is, it? is this software? And, you know, um, so that one particularly is, is uh, becoming troublesome for me. Um, and I, and I, I, like I said, you know, Chris and I have talked about this, uh, but it you, used to really not happen that much for some reason. I'm seeing a lot more now. Yeah, I mean, the, the Mark II off-the-shelf unit that I've got here is... Uh, the audio is fairly unreliable, uh, and it has to do with boot up and stuff. And actually, I hear clicks and pops when I turn it on. So I think there might there might be something about a loose connection or something like that. I might have to open it up and take a look. Well, the clicks well, and pops that would be coincidental that that both of them had a loose connection. It's probably bring up timing issues. Uh, but presumably, yeah. I will ha experience. I'll be fortunate enough to experience this pain when I receive my device, so I can look into it as well. But okay. I'll fix it. Yes, well, I think Gez was also looking at possibly something that, you know, in his startup um, check, you know, project he was working on. But, yeah. But anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ken, Ken's probably right, actually. Um, we, we, there are some known issues there. And But you mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, did you say something about the board Kevin's working on? Uh, you were saying this was uh, no, no. So I may have must have spoken. Um, okay. It, it seemed like you were, there was something about the audio uh, that you thought was going to interfere with us, with us doing the side by side comparison of the new versus the old design. Uh, well, no. This would just be in that it just becomes like well, it would. I mean, I, I guess I could see it becoming a difficult for Kevin as well if he's seeing the same type of thing and he's testing. Uh, you know, new board, and it's okay. Is this the board issue, or is this the, this known audio bug? And it just becomes, you know, if you have to, have to reboot it so many times, you know, you just keep going to ten, or you know, what point do you do you give up? And so, usually in the past, it, it like I don't think I'd ever encountered it where I had to reboot it four times. I had to get it to work. Uh, that was, like yesterday was the first time. Uh, Sorry, so on the audio thing, one other thing that I, I, I wanted to, to kind of insert there was the big difference between this and our previous Mark II prototypes. There's a couple of them. One is we're running on an RPI 4, another is we're running Buster instead of Jesse. And um, the third is that we're, we're based on a Pycroft image instead of based on a Mark I image. So those are the three major things that are different to me between this prototype. And the prototype we had prior to this um, that did not have this issue. So I'm wondering if one of those three things has something maybe the drivers that the Raspberry Pi for, or the drivers that um, that the Pycroft supplies for the Respeaker array. I think so. That some of that may be a good starting point as far as things to look into that might be causing the issue. Chris, was the Pycroft image based on? Um... Jesse or Buster? Buster. And this new image is also based on Buster then? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah the, the Jesse image was for the old um, Mark II uh, prototype we had. It was Pi 3 based. Well, I, all I was getting at is, so we don't seem to have this problem with the Raspberry Pi 3s running it. So that would probably take the operating system out of the equation. No, it's not drivers, but the OS, right? Well, correct me if I'm wrong. The unit on my desk is a Pi 3. Yeah, but we already, my point is we already run well. We know we run well on Buster. So we're not saying it's a Buster issue, right? We know we run well on Jesse. Well, but I thought the Pycroft was based on Buster. The newest Pycroft image is, but I don't know. Old like, Pycroft image. 
The, the newest Pie Corrupt image is based on the old Pie Corrupt image, correct? We shouldn't, we can't mix Pie Corrupt and, and, the, and the Mark II image. The, the Pie Corrupt is the basis of the Mark II image. Yeah. And the most recent Pie Corrupt image is Buster based. And I the don't know runs, enough anecdotal runs evidence runs about Pi that Pi image to know if there's issues with it, like if other people are having issues with it. Um, regarding audio or not. Like I Well, let me ask the question this way. I just saw a video today that was actually excellent. You were right, Michael, that uh, showed how to get the PyCroft image running on your Pi 3, correct? Chris, right? Is the, one that that, image... uh, the one that Chris Adair shared on my yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. that image running Jesse or Buster? Uh, it depends on which one she downloaded. It's probably running Buster. All right. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's turn this into a ticket, and uh, if it's not already, and uh, get it assigned to somebody to figure out. Yeah, it, it. Well, there was a ticket at one point, but I guess it should probably go under Mark Two now in the new organization of things, since. Oh well, yeah, it's like definitely salt. definitely occurring on the Mark II. So yeah, if it's occurring yeah. in other no, places, that's the only place it's happening, right? Well, I don't know if it's occurring other places. Uh, whether it's on. Oh. Yeah. Well, I haven't Where's done it? yet a set up a Mycroft lab. I suppose I'll have to retire to my garage and have a Raspberry Pi three and a Mark one and a Mark two and a laptop and something running. You know. Uh, speaking of all. which, do we have any Mark ones that uh, Ken can have? Uh, oh yeah, that's a good point. I should uh, I should pack one of those up to try to send it with you tomorrow. Okay, I can do that. Yeah, Ken one of you. I've got a couple on the shelf behind me up here. If you if you guys need one, I got. Uh, Derek's already sending them a Mark two, so just send them together. Yeah, I've got I've got one, or I've got a few. Yeah, Derek, go ahead and assign that audio system instability problem ticket to me as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be getting the hardware and bringing it up and experiencing the pain, and I'm going to fix it anyway. <laughs> you <know? laughs> there you go. I will All close right. the ticket. That's, why, that's exactly why all developers need to have these on their desks. Right, right. All right, so, uh, excellent. Um, so, Derek, have you been in touch with Kevin today about the hardware and the status there? Uh, I I haven't. Um, okay. I've just been kind of waiting for him to. He's been pretty good about sending updates, but uh, yeah, nothing today so far. Yeah, we had some pretty exciting updates on Monday, um, but uh, so the the bad news is that I did have a chat with him this afternoon, and. Uh, he seems to have hit a snag. Like he got the entire board up and running except for the LEDs on the back, and that was just because they were the last step to install. So everything was working. But um, by the time he got the LEDs on board and was testing that last system, somehow the, the short had reappeared between one volt and ground. And uh, so he's trying to figure out what's going on there. Um, so he had gotten the uh, the XMOS chip up and running, and it was working fine. He actually recorded some audio samples and sent them over to us, and that was pretty cool. Uh, so we, we know all the system, subsystems work, um, but he's just having some problem with, uh, with the manual soldering uh, step. Uh, something, something's going wrong there. So, um, uh, so he's going to be working on that this afternoon. Hopefully he'll be able to resolve it. Um, but, uh, but at least we know that, you know, uh, in theory, all the parts work. It's just a matter of getting the assembly down. So, I got a, I got a generic question on the hardware. Um, the the mic array is that one of the things that's controlled by the XMOS chip? Yeah, that's its whole purpose. Okay, and uh, can you configure it to just use a single mic out of the entire array? Yeah, you can. There's a lot that you can configure about it. Yeah, good. You can turn off all the subcomponents of the echo cancellation and you can fine tune the you know parameters uh, and and the delay between the input and the output and all this kind of stuff so we have the uh, does anybody know the uh, part number on the XMOS chip so I can dig up the specs or well if you we were the, uh, 
manuals yeah. uh, the, on the chip to the uh, website somewhere? Yeah, if you go to the GitHub repo for the Mark II uh, hardware, uh, everything's there. Oh, very cool. Yeah, uh, no, the only reason I asked is I didn't know what a mic array was, and I started researching a little, and lo and behold, a lot of the results came back, mic arrays suck. So I'm like, oh, goodness, I hope I can turn them off. <laughs> That's why I asked. Well, well, it's kind of, it's, it is kind of misleading to a certain degree because a lot of people in the community, they talk about, oh, have you used this mic array? And then they'll point to like a $10 re-speaker mic array or something. But it's just, and a lot of those are just for microphones that are just connected to the Pi uh, with no um, DSP. So the, um, the XMOS can, in certain firmware versions, and I, the firmware version we are using for the re-speaker combines all the input of the microphone for you. Uh, and just so the, 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 the Pi only really sees it as one microphone because all the, all the processing has already happened. Um, so we're not doing that. We're not having to do that on the Pi. Whereas like some of the other options, you have to do that in software on the Pi, right? You have to use some other software-based DSP. So we, with, we will want to use a firmware, I will assume, uh, we'll want to use the firmware that combines, you know, the app, or it does all the, the, the processing for us and gives us one audio stream, a cleaned up, essentially clean, nice audio. Um, that's that's kind of the firmware nice. documentation is on the GitHub repository as well. It, like, there, you know, what it, there might, you might have to link over to the Xmos. Site. And, what's that? Uh, Xmos has some very extensive documentation on their website, okay. so it's probably yeah, yeah, linked yeah. there. Yeah. Okay, good. So, so really, and so it's kind of a misnomer to just call it a microarray. It's really a microarray plus a DSP, like a plus a dedicated hardware DSP. Right, it's running some specific echo cancellation, you know, far field uh, algorithms. Um, so, right, so hopefully we'll get some news on that, uh, uh, hopefully today or tomorrow. Um, I don't have any other updates right now. Uh, is there anything else people want to talk about? Uh, things seem to be moving along. So, all right then, I guess we'll, we'll call uh, it there. Well, yeah, just one, oh. thing, just one thing, Michael, for sure. your edification. So remember I talked about a skill where you could say, you know, improve recognizer accuracy and it would go through that whole process. Um, in case you were wondering, it wasn't like I was planning on training on your machine. I was planning on simply sending a notification to the back end. Uh, as part of what I just finished, there is a, there's now a data pathway for requesting the training server to train. Mm -hmm. And so right now that is very specific for responding off a nightly trigger, but could be expanded to allow that to basically create the models for the device in the cloud and then send them back down, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, I think there, there's even a ticket for something like that in the, uh, in the system. Yeah, so, I, so by building this, just with a little bit of um, enhancement, I can expand that, that process flow to handle things like that, where we could allow people to, to train in our cloud, if you will, and then download the model. But yeah. Right. So anyway, that, that, uh, that was where I was going. I wasn't planning on doing it locally. So the just to bring up a, something sort of tangentially related to that, uh, Derek and I had uh, some pretty good conversations around uh, how to close the loop on the um, intent processing side of this uh, back in what, last December. Um, so we've got some ideas about about that that we can we can uh, talk about when once we get through the precise side of things. You're talking about uh, Pedacious and that whole uh, yeah branch yeah that that. Spaghetti Junction code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the idea of basically letting the user interactively uh, correct the system and recording those corrections, and uh, you know, and learning from our those mistakes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's okay. Well, that's a neural well, network. Which is, uh, right. I don't believe it's based on TensorFlow. It's, uh, it's it's an interesting algorithm. It's an interesting tree search. But uh, okay.
Yeah. But and it could just it might not have anything to do with retraining. It just might be about collecting more data. You know. But um, but that's a topic for another day. Yeah. Sure. All right. Yeah. Okay. I was going to bring up the other idea too around collecting. Well, I can do it really briefly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we're going to have the the action button on the new device, right? And so we've talked about using that action button to possibly collect um, wake word um, missed utterances or missed, you know, um, someone said the wake word doesn't get caught, right? So you might hit that action button and we could come up with something that says like, um, oh, did I not hear you say, hey, Mycroft, uh, would you be all right with me uploading the last you know, minute worth of, of audio or something? Um, <clears throat> to try and catch some of those those missed um, wake words. Yeah, we could do that, or that could be that that action button could trigger the skill I'm thinking about right, and which is the same thing, which would play back like the last five or ten uh, captured wake words and say, was this really the wake word? Was this really a wake word? Was this really a right. wake word? And then right. boom, send them up. Yeah, so th that button could trigger that skill. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's lots of ideas we should uh, we should think about for having using that button that we really just haven't had on the market too yet. Yeah, I think it's going to be a, a thing that'll be something we want to play around with and you know, just figure out what is the real, what's a good user experience for that stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah because it's, it's going to be better to um, have them help with that process manually than to try to put a bunch of code in a already tight loop that's listening and try to figure out if it was really a wake word or a missed wake word. That's just not, not going to happen there. I think the comment I made on your user stories was along the same thing, which was, no, I don't think it should send three samples. I think it should send one sample with two science stamps, right? Right. So, um, OK. Yeah. Well, then. One thing I could do all about the same thing. The, um, <clears throat> about JIRA, I did. I don't know if this, you might have seen this, but you may not have uh, the the ID for the core project is no longer MC, it's core, C-O-R-E. And the um, ID for the Mycroft skills project is no longer MS, it's skill, S-K-I-L-L. -L. So hopefully that will help some of the confusion as far as which projects, which which goes where in the uh, just the two letter <laughs> right. acronym being used. Yeah, I saw you renamed the hardware to MK2 and MK1 as well, so that's good. Yeah. Always good to have TLS. <laughs> Three-letter acronym, recursive. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, now I'm going to stop it. We're done now. Talk to you all on Friday. All right. Talk to you on Friday. Have a good day. See you guys. Bye.